God's Word this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for your Word. It is the truth, and we receive it this night, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for revelation of it. We take hold of it. We'll be doers of it. We will see the fruit from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of the priesthood. We've talked about Jesus being our high priest. We gave, brought a message on understanding the responsibilities of the priesthood. We talked about how we become a holy priest in the holy priesthood and how we become a royal priest in the royal priesthood. And last message, we talked about how we war as a king in a, being a royal priest. Today we're going to, we, just, we have a message today and we're still going to have one more on Sunday morning on this subject. But how do, we're going to talk about how to specifically operate as a royal priest today. A lot of important things to show you what you need to be doing if you're going to operate as a king are going to come forth. 1 Peter 2.9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You are a royal, ruling, reigning priesthood. We pointed out the fact that what Jesus Christ accomplished for us, he's made us, in Revelation 1, 6, he's made us kings and priests unto God. You are a king, you are to rule, and you are to reign under the lordship of Jesus. We talked about what happened when we got born again in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the authority, the word power here means authority, it's exousia, from the authority of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You are in the kingdom, which is a position of rule that you are to rule from. We also saw that the way this is going to operate is from on the inside of you. In Luke chapter 17, in answering about where the kingdom was, verse 21, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's because the Lord is within you, and the kingdom is going to operate by the Spirit from Him dwelling on the inside of you. We see in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, you're of God, little children, and have overcome or have conquered and carried off the victory because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The greater one is on the inside of you. Because the greater one's in you, the kingdom's in you, the king is in you, you are to rule and you are to reign. We saw another scripture it's important to realize. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. If by one man's offense death reigned by one, sin opened the door for death to reign because of Adam's sin. How much more they which receive the abundance of grace, which now we receive through Jesus Christ, and of the gift of righteousness, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. God wants you to reign in life through Jesus Christ. By really means through Jesus Christ working in your life. You are a king. Kings have authority. Kings are to rule with authority. And the way they rule is they're going to speak commands or decrees that they're going to speak according to law. We're speaking according to spiritual law. We're going to bring things forth, and we're also going to see the rule of our, of our enemies come forth. Kings also fight in battle. They have a kingdom over which they rule. In fact, the word kingdom comes from king and dom, short for domain. A kingdom is a territory or realm over which a king rules. You and I now can rule and reign in the heavens and in the earth because Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and he's given us dominion in these areas. The way that you rule is by speaking commands, as you're going to see tonight. You will bring forth the things of God. As you speak the commands, you will fight successfully in ruling over the enemy. Also, the way you bring things forth, you're going to learn to pray. You pray commands or demands, legal demands, that are due you, or speak commands into being to bring forth the blessings, or the things that God wants to bring forth in your life. And ruling over the enemy, 
There's seven main ways that we'll be talking about, that'll be on Sunday, to bring forth his rule against the enemy. Now to bring forth the things of God, we're gonna focus on that tonight as you're operating as a king. Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You already have been blessed with all the spiritual blessings. They are spiritual blessings. They're in heavenly places in Christ. They belong unto you. You must understand because of this, this means all the promises of God, everything that he has given forth, belongs to you. It is yours. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, he says, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. All things that have been given unto you, they're yours. You are to possess them in your life. In 2 Corinthians, he spoke to the church at Corinth. Verse 21, he said, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. They're yes, and they are amen. In fact, when you would say they are amen, it's interesting that whenever this was spoken, when they spoke this saying amen, you were declaring that the substance of what was uttered was your, is your own. Otherwise, you're declaring, that's mine. That belongs to me. All things are mine. You say amen, you're declaring, so is it. It's mine. So is it. I take hold of that. I believe that. It may be fulfilled in my life. God wants us to know that all the promises, they're not maybe. They're not for some certain ones and not for others. They're amen for every single person. Now, as you've been born again, you've come into inheritance. And of course, whose inheritance is it? It's the inheritance of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, remember Jesus was born from the dead, born again, the firstborn again, establishing the church of the firstborn. Hebrews 1, 2, He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. He's the heir of all things. He has an inheritance now of all the promises of God, by whom also he made the worlds. Well, because when you get born again, you receive the Spirit of Jesus Christ, you're in the same position that he is in. In Romans chapter 8, verse 17, If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. You're a joint heir with Jesus. All the things that he is an heir of, you're an heir of. He's an heir of all things. You're an heir of all things. All things are yours. This is inheritance that belongs to you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Or this means to cause, be born again. He's brought forth a new birth in our life. Unto a lively hope through, this really means, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this is also plural, talking about where he came up from those people that were dead, as he was born from spiritual death into spiritual life. And what do we come to? To an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away. Where is this inheritance? It's reserved in heaven for you. It is in the New Testament document that is reserved in heaven. All these promises belong to you. Remember, we've been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, they belong to us. So this is inheritance that's reserved for you and me. But we have to take hold of them, and we have to bring them into being. Hebrews chapter 4, over in verse 16, says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain, this is a Greek word lombana, which means take hold of, mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. You are going to take hold of the promises that have been given unto you. Now, in order to do this, you're going to make legal demands of what is due you and commands according to spiritual law in New Testament prayer or in confession of the word in order to bring the promises into being. 
You're not going to be asking God to do something for you. You're not going to be petitioning to see if he's going to respond. You're going to be making demands of what's due you and commands to bring these things into being. And this is so important. John chapter 16. In John chapter 16, verse 23, we see the change in New Testament prayer from the Old Testament. He said, in that day, Jesus speaking, you shall ask, arateo, making a request, this means requesting as a favor, mean nothing. You do not pray to Jesus. You don't ask him anything. Verily, verily, I say unto whatsoever you shall ask, it's a different word, I tell you, the Father, in my name, he will give it you. Who do we pray to? The Father. In the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus is bringing in the high priestly ministry of Jesus into manifestation. These words, Eratio number 2065, and Iteo number 154 in Strong's, are shown the exact meanings here. 2065 means a request as a favor. We don't make a request as a favor now. We now do 154. A demand of something due. You're going to make a demand of something that is due you. You're going to make a demand of the Father in order to release that which has already been given unto you. And He, the Father, will give it to you. You're going to do it in the name of Jesus. Hitherto, up to this time, have you made a demand of what's due you of nothing in my name. Make a demand and you shall take hold of it. This is the word for what ask us here. I tell you, make a demand. And this is a commanding statement. You are commanded to make demands of what's due you. Imperative mood. And you shall take hold of it. You're to take hold of it to see all these promises come to pass, that your joy may be full and your joy will be full when you see the promises of God coming to pass in area after area after area of your life. New Testament prayers, pray unto the Father in the name of Jesus. With thanksgiving you do this, making legal demands to take hold of promises and commanding to bring forth the will of God and things into being. That means if you're asking, requesting, petitioning, or if you're waiting passively for God to do something, you're not thanking Him when you're praying, we're not operating as a king. Kings speak things into being and they bring things forth. When we look at New Testament prayer in another place, Matthew chapter 6, you'll see this commanding aspect of what you do in prayer when you're making a demand of what's due you, you're actually commanding these promises to come into being. Matthew chapter 6, here in verse 9, when it talks about how they would pray. After this manner, therefore pray you. This isn't something you pray, it's showing you how to pray. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. In verse 10, it says, Thy kingdom come. Do we just pray that, just like we're just praying words and not knowing what it we're talking about? The word come is a commanding word. It's an imperative mood. The way you would translate this is, Thy kingdom, come. You're commanding his kingdom to come into being. Thy will, become or come into being. This is also a commanding statement. Otherwise, you don't pray, quite asking, petitioning. You command. Why? You say, well, that just seems like, why, why would I be commanding God? because you're going to release God. And how does God operate? He commands. He gives commands. So you're just going to be a vessel for Him, so you're going to give commands that releases Him to accomplish these things. Kingdom, come. Will of God, become. Come to pass. What you're speaking on in earth as it is in heaven. When it says, give us this daily, our, our, day, our daily bread, Young's kind of brings it out a little bit better. Our appointed bread, give us today. Because the word give is, again, a commanding statement. 
It's not trying to be disrespectful of God, as some people might think, if they're thinking in the natural, carnally, or thinking that they're trying to make God do something. You are speaking what He wants you to speak to release Him to bring it to pass. You command Him to give you the daily bread, the feeding of the Word of God, and all your needs being met. When it comes to verse 12, and forgive all of these, these are commanding statements. When you pray, you make commands. That's how you pray. 99% of all the prayers out there of Christians are not like this at all. They do not pray commanding prayers. They're praying everything else but that. We're supposed to speak commands to bring things into being. Forgive our debts. You're making a command for God's forgiveness for him to forgive you because it's the promise of God and that's how you release him to come to bring these things to pass. We make like a demand of what's due us. We command him to forgive our debts as we, and then it says forgiving here, it's talking about you and I forgiving our debtors, present tense, otherwise that's what we need to do, forgive our debtors. But as we forgive our debtors meeting the conditions, we command him to forgive our debts. Now when he says, lead us not into temptation, this is a subjunctive mood that you might not, that you may not lead us into temptation or temptation refers to place a period of testing. Why would God not have to do that? Because if we're walking in his ways, we're following him, walking uprightly. But if we get contrary to it, you know, he's going gonna, gonna to test us to see whether or not we're going to walk right before the Lord. Then he goes on and says, deliver us from evil. This is a commanding statement again. You command him to deliver you from evil. You're speaking these things into being. Now this may seem hard for a lot of times people to take hold of. Since when do I demand God? Well, God said it right there. You speak commanding statements. Deliver me from evil. Because who are you praying to? The Father in the name of Jesus. You're speaking these things into being. Commanding the things of God to come to pass. And that is so important. For thine is the kingdom. The kingdom is the release of the authority that's been given unto you as a king. The commands, the rule by commands. Power, that is the result of those commands being spoken for. The power of God goes in operation. And the glory, that is the manifest presence of God when authority and power is released. You're going to issue commands as a king that puts the power of God in operation and brings the manifest presence of God to come to pass. Now, God has told us in his word that we are to command the work of his hands. It's in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11. Last part of this verse says, Concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. You command the work of God's hands. That's just simply releasing him to accomplish things. Not trying to make him do something. You can't make God do anything. It's got to be according to the word. You're commanding the work of his hands because that's the way he operates. He issues commands. If you look at what Jesus did, he was commanding his disciples. He was commanding everything. He commanded sicknesses to leave. He commanded demons to come out. You'll see this later. He issued commands in everything that he did. And if you think that in Matthew chapter 6 was just, well, was it that way also over in Luke? It sure was. Luke chapter 11, verse 2 here, when it says, A kingdom come. Same thing. These are imperative statements. I will come to become or come to pass. Again, commanding statements. Verse 3, give us. Commanding statement. Give. It's imperative mood again. This is the way that they were taught, the way that Christians should be praying. Forgive. Making a command for the forgiving as we are forgiving others. Again, lead us not into temptation is, that's conditional. That may you not 
lead us into temptation if or, or into testing. Temptation means testing. He's not testing us, tempt, tempting us through the devil. God tests us with his word to find out whether we're going to walk in his ways. If we're walking his ways already, we wouldn't have to be tested. But if we're not, he's going to find out if we are going to walk in his ways. So temptation can have a negative context from Satan working, but it's also what God does to test us. Remember he said unto Abraham, he called him and he tested Abraham in order to see whether or not he would obey him when he told him, go up and offer your son up on the Mount Moriah. So he, it was a test to see whether he'd obey. And deliver us again, this is again the command. We make commands in order to release God's authority and power to bring things into being. And that's what he wants. Jesus spoke things into being by declaring commands. And remember, Jesus didn't do anything of himself. He only did what the Father told him to do. So he wasn't speaking from himself. He was speaking from what the Father told him to do to release the Father to accomplish everything. He spoke commands. Hebrews 1.3, who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding. Upholding really means here, it can be translated bring or to bring things forth. It means to bring or bring forth. Bringing forth all things by the spoken word of his power. He spoke, he commanded or spoke the word of God, making demands or commands, speaking things into being. He spoke the word, declaring what it was, decreeing things in order to bring things into manifestation. What did Abraham do to see things come to pass? He spoke things into being by calling things that were not happening as happening. He spoke them into being. That's what you and I do. Romans 4, 17. Abraham calleth those things which be not, not as though they were. That's a mistake. That be not as being is correct in the Greek. Things that are not being is being. Otherwise, he spoke them into being as he make, made st statements, decreeing statements. And that's what God wants you and me to do. Over in Hebrews, Chapter 4, when we confess God's word, what are we doing? Seeing we have a great high priest in the past in the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We speak things into being and we keep holding fast to it, keep speaking it into being to bring things into manifestation. Hebrews chapter 10, over here in verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our, this is the word hope, not faith. It's el peace. Should have been translated hope. It is in all other translations. Hope 53 times, one time faith erroneously here. YLT, hope. New King James Version, they change it to hope. All the translations change it to hope. The King James was wrong on what they did. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, because that is the release of your faith. Without wavering, or unmoved, firm, nothing is going to make us be moved whatsoever. For he is faithful that promised. Because what are we doing? We're speaking promises into being. And he's faithful that promised. And he's going to bring it to pass. As you and I hold fast, speaking these things into being. See, kings are going to make commands, they're going to make demands, they're going to decree things and speak things into being. And that's what God wants you to do. We see a scripture over in Job. Job chapter 22. Verse 28. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee and the light shall shine upon my ways. A decree is making an official order given by one in authority. You're decreeing things. The kings make decrees. They decree things. It's an official order given by one in authority that must be carried out. It's like an official statement made by, the, by a king that's got to happen and come to pass. It's done from a position of authority. It's done according to law. Well, 
you and I are kings under Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. What do we do? We make decrees, which are official orders given by you and me as one with delegated authority. And we are speaking this according to spiritual law. And it must be carried out and come to pass because decrees, they have to be performed. Angels perform the word. They perform, they do as commandments, remember? Because what are we speaking? Commands into being to release these things to come to pass. So you are going to speak and decree promises into being. You speak them into being. Otherwise, you're going to release them to come into manifestation. Let's look at some scriptures and look at them doing this. We see in Matthew chapter 14, verse 27, here's where Jesus walking on the sea, and they were afraid. Straightway Jesus spake unto them and said, Be of good cheer. It was a commanding statement. He spoke this. He just didn't make a nice little comment. He commanded them to be of a good courage or good cheer. And he said, it's I, be not afraid. Again, he was commanding. He'd issue commanding statements to them all the time. Command after command after command after command, as you will see. Everything he was doing, he was operating in authority. In fact, in Mark chapter 1, they noticed this about Jesus. The people were amazed at what he was doing. Mark 1, 27, they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? What's this all about? Nobody goes around commanding things, but Jesus did, because he was bringing forth the New Testament. For with authority commanded the, even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. He's commanding, using authority and commanding, because authority operates. When you are a king, you operate with authority, Operate according to law with its power. So authority and power is going into operation. You're going to command things to happen. We see over in Mark chapter 1, verse 41. Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be thou clean. This is in response to the leper who said, if you will, you can make me clean. He just questioned his will. Well, Jesus answered him and said, I will. But then how did he release this? He said, be thou clean. He didn't say, well, I'm going to pray and see if God will do something for you. No. Imperative statement. Be thou clean. He spoke it into being with a commanding statement. And what happened? As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he was cleansed. Tremendous power and authority being released. Knock that out just like that. God wants us to understand we speak commanding words. In Mark chapter 5, down here in verse 34, this is the woman who had the issue of blood. He said unto him, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Commanding statement, he spoke, told her. Commanding, imperative mood. And be whole of thy plague. He comes a commanding statement he makes. Be whole. Be thou whole. The imperative mood. Commanding it into being. And it brings the results. You are a king. You are to issue commands. If you have not learned to issue commands, you're not taking your place as a rightful royal priest. You're to rule and reign in life. God wants us to learn to start commanding things into being. Mark chapter 5. Here's the one. He was on the way to see this ruler of the synagogue's daughter be healed or to be, end up being raised from the dead. Verse 35 in Mark 5. While yet spake there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter's dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? That was the temptation. Give up, throw in the towel, quit. What did Jesus do on, on that one? As soon as he heard the word that was spoken, hey, you've got to deal with that thing right away, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. These were commanding statements that he made to him. 
be not afraid. I guess it must be it's one of these somewhere. Maybe it's underneath it. Or must only believe, I guess that's the one where it is. Yeah, the imperative's there. It's all just shown on that. Be not afraid, but only believe. Commanding them. God wants you to believe. He commands them to do those things. And he responded to it. And then when he comes over here to the daughter, what's he do? He doesn't have nice little prayer time. Mark 5, 44, 41, he took the damsel by the hand, and he said unto her, To litha kumai, which be interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. He commanded her to get up. Arise. Authority and power being released. This is Jesus operating in the New Testament. This is the way you and I are to operate. Speak commands. He wants you to speak commands and speak things into being. You've got to know you're a king. You've got to understand this is how things operate if you are going to operate as a king. Every one of us need to rise up and start functioning as a king. Mark chapter 7, over here in verse 34. This is the guy who was deaf and had impediment of speech. So, took him aside from the multitude, put his finger in the ears, spit and touched his tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephapha, that is, be opened. He spoke this into being. And again, a commanding statement. Be opened. And see, what's he doing? He's releasing God to do this. Because was he doing it himself? No. Because it's a passive voice. He's just speaking into being, and God's the one who's doing it. Passive voice, not him actively doing it. Use issue commands, and God's doing it through you. But if you don't issue the commands, God will not do these things through you. You have to speak them into being. He commanded them. Every place they went, when he sent the twelve out, or the, the disciples out, to go preach the gospel. This is the 70 here, this, this place. He comes down, he says, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be unto the house. You speak to that house. You speak Peace be to this house, wherever it's at. I guess you say, I guess that's to say is the commanding statement. Yeah, you make a commanding statement. Peace be to the house. You speak it to it. God wants you to understand you're a king and you're to operate in authority. You're to speak commands. Jesus spoke commands all over the place. That's what you and I are supposed to do. Speak commands. Look what we see over in the, man, the guy getting, who was the, at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. Verse 8. What's Jesus say to this guy? Remember, this is the guy that said he didn't have anybody to put him in the water. And the angel came down and troubled the water. He said, Arise, take up your bed, walk. Every one of these are commands. He commands these things into being. Rise. This was he saying it for yourself. This is where he had to get up. Take up, so he had to do something. He, may, he had to act on the, that himself. Take up your bed. He's commanding him to do that. And he's commanding him to walk. Every, each one of these are all imperative. Commanding him. He spoke it into being. And every time it happened, because he knew what he was doing. He was issuing commands. He was operating as a king. How about when Lazarus gets raised from the dead? Jesus comes up there. Luke chapter 11, 43. He had spoken. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He commands him to come forth. Imperative mood. Speaks it into being. Commanding that. And the Spirit comes back into his body. God wants us to learn to command things into being. And if you think it was just Jesus, hey, these guys learned to do the same thing. In the book of Acts, 
Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Here's this guy that's, if you remember here, they were coming into the time of hour of prayer. And this guy, lame from his mother's womb, was carried there. In verse 2, they laid daily at the gate of the temple called Beautiful to ask alms of them to enter in the temple. We see in Peter and John about to go into the temple asking alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him, but John said, Look on us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something. He said, Silver and gold have I none. They thought he was going to give them money. But such as I have, give I thee. I got something to give you. I got a command to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He commanded him. Again, imperative mood. And he commanded him to walk. Rise up and walk. These were commanding statements. Releasing the miraculous power of God. Took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He issued the command, now get up. And he was healed. God wants us to issue commands as kings. And this guy, he leaped up, stood and walked, entered with him in the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Miraculous works being done because of giving commands, operating as a king. Acts chapter 14. This is Paul later here. This guy was impotent in his feet from a cripple from his mother's womb, never walked at Lystra. Verse 9, the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly behold him, perceiving he had faith to be healed, that he believed. So what did he do? He said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. He issued a command for him to get up. It was a command, imperative mood. Get up. And he leaped and walked. And he was healed. Because he issued a command, speaking as a king, Releasing authority and power. Issuing commands to bring forth God's work of restoring and healing this guy and making him every whit whole. God wants us to understand we are to make commands. In Matthew chapter 8, over in verse 5. Remember this guy? Here's in verse 5. Jesus was entering to Capernaum, and there came a centurion beseeching him, and he says, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, but grievously tormented. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. So the Syrian says, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. He understood. He saw Jesus speaking, commanding words, and people were being healed. People were being delivered. People were being set free. To speak these commanding words. Well, how, why, why would he know this? He says, well, I, I understand how this thing works. For I'm a man under authority. And I understand what authority means. Having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go. And he goes. Come. And he comes. To my servant. Do this. And he doeth it. He speaks commanding words. And it happens. So I understood. I see Jesus doing the same thing. And look what Jesus' response was. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. He never had, hadn't found anything like this. This guy knew how to operate. That means great faith operates when you are operating as a king, issuing commands, speaking things into being making decrees, speaking these things. That's what God wants us to do, taking hold of promises that belongs to us. Sometimes we make the demand and then we take hold of it in order to bring it to pass, to release it to come to pass. He made commands. He knew they'd be carried out. That's great faith. That's what God wants. When you issue commands and you know it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Because God is a performer of his word. This, this is faith. So you've been given faith to do what? Speak things into being, issue commands, and see God accomplish everything. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we having the same spirit of faith, 
according as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. It's not just believing, it's speaking to release it to come to pass. You are to issue commands and speak things into being. Look over here at Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, we pick up here in verse 23. When he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. Interesting, the word tempest here is the word seismos. The same word translated earthquake 13 times, but here translated tempest. It's like there was an earthquake under the water that caused a tremendous upheaval of a violent storm. Violent, uh, a uh, great tempest, so much the ship was covered with the waves. I mean, they just covered the whole thing. We're not talking about just a little storm blowing up. I mean, it's like an earthquake hit the thing. But he was asleep. Disciples came to him and woke him and said, Lord, save us, we perish. You know, they, they thought it was all over for them. What did he do? He arose unto him. He says, why are you so fearful, O you of little faith? He's saying, essentially, you, what's wrong? Where's your faith? Your little faith. He arose and he rebuked the winds and sea, and there was a great calm. He rebuked them. He charged them. This means to, to admonish and charge sharply. He, he commanded. You do that when you make a command. He stopped it right then and there, and that was it. And there was a great calm. This is operating as a king, releasing power, authority. Over in Mark's account of this, Mark chapter 4, down here in verse uh, 37, there arose a great storm. It's a different word. It's a word we're talking about, a tempestuous wind or violent attack of a wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. I mean, the thing was overflowing. And he was in the hundred part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. They wake him and said, Master, carest not that we perish? <laughs> he arose, rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. He spoke commanding words. Peace. He stopped that thing. Be still. Stop. That's the word just essentially say, stop the mouth. Or silence. Stop the thing. He commanded it into being. That's how he released things to happen. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And then he says to him, he said to him, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? <laughs> In essence, if we don't learn to speak commands, we don't have any faith. Or we have little faith, like he said to the other guy, the other one said. This is where you have no faith. Otherwise, faith will issue commands and stop these things. Anything that the devil stirs up, we need to start issuing commands. And no, believe those commands, speaking with authority and power, and knowing that God is going to perform them. In Luke's account, this is the statement that was made in verse 23. They say, say they fell asleep. There came down a storm of wind on the lake. They were filled with water and were in jeopardy. Came to him, woke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. He arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. And they said unto him, he said unto him, Where's your faith? Their faith was supposed to do this. And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? <laughs> Where did this guy come from? For he commands even the winds and waters, and they obey him. He issued commands, didn't he? That's how faith operates. You and I are kings. We're to issue commands. We're to make decrees. We're to speak things into being. Very interesting, when we look at these tenses in these places, some of these scriptures. Matthew chapter 9, over in verse 29. This is where, when he touched their eyes, and he says, according to your faith, 
be it unto you. It's interesting. When you put this here, this is the word ginnamai. In essence, he really said, according to your faith, come to pass. He spoke it, commanded it into being. He commanded it into being according to their faith and because they had faith, and he simply spoke that into being. Their eyes were open. He touched their eyes, and it happened. Their eyes were open. He spoke a commanding word, speaking it into being. Over in Matthew, chapter 15, this is the woman who has daughter had the demon in her. And in verse 28, Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And when he said, be it, become, this he made a commandment, commanding statement because he saw her faith. He made a commanding statement. Come to pass as you will. He just spoke it into being. And what happened? Her daughter was made whole from that very hour. He released authority and power because he operated as a king. And remember, he does nothing of himself. He's just speaking what the Father tells him to speak. You and I do nothing of ourselves. We just speak what the Word declares us to speak to release him to accomplish these great works. Over Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. If we go back, this is where the disciples came to Jesus apart and said, why couldn't we cast them out? Well, were they issuing commands? He goes on and says, because of their unbelief, that was part of their problem, they were in unbelief. That was the problem, apparently. And then he says, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, which you, say, you do, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place. When he said, Remove hence, he made a commanding statement. You command this thing, remove. And it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. When you learn how to command and believe what you're saying, and put your faith in operation. Operate as a king, releasing authority and power. Nothing will be impossible to you. These are tremendous scriptures, tremendous points. Mark chapter 10. We got to know we're a king. And we got to operate as a king. Mark 10, 52, if we go back, this is talking about the guy who was blind. And he was calling him. He casting away his garment, meaning, hey, I know I'm going to be healed. I don't need this anymore. Rose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said to him, What wilt that I shall do unto thee? Blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. He said, Go thy way. When he makes this statement, he's making a commanding statement. Imperative move. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. He spoke commanding words that brought these things into being. Over in Mark, chapter 11, verse 22. Jesus answered and said, Have faith in God. The word have here is an imperative mood. He essentially was commanding them in its present tense, be having faith in God. He's commanding, he's speaking to those guys. Be having faith in God. We're supposed to, he's telling them, you be having faith in God. Your be having is, this is to be operating in your life, continually. And then he tells them what to do. For verily I say unto the whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. When you say, be thou removed, you command that. Be removed. And be thou cast into the sea. Again, another commanding statement. Commanding. And shall not doubt in his heart, you got to believe what you say. And remember also that when you're making commands, shall believe that those things which he says, present tense, and are continuing to say, which is the continual speaking to the mountain to be removed, 
not shall come to pass, that's future tense. We put the cursor over this, and it's a present tense indicating, believe those things which you say and are continuing to say are coming to pass, present tense. That's critical. When you issue commands, it's happening. You believe it's happening. You speak it into being and command it to happen and believe it's happening. He says, you'll have whatsoever you say. It's going to come to pass. In verse 24, when we're talking about in prayer, we're making demands or what are do us. Mark 11, 24, Therefore I say unto what things soever you desire. This is this word, Iteo, 154. And remember, this means a demand of something due. We're making demands of what's due us to release them to come into being. We're not, we're not asking to see if he's going to do it. It's already ours. We're making a demand of what's due us according to spiritual law. We're speaking that into being, commanding that, essentially. Making a demand. What things, whoever you make a demand, what's due you? When you pray, believe. And you are commanded to believe that you take hold of this. Imperative mood. You believe you take hold of that. See, anytime you're taking hold of it, you're, you, you, you're commanded to believe that you take hold of it. I believe I take hold of that in the name of Jesus. You're commanded to do that. And all of these are present tense verbs because you do it continuously. Remember, you keep speaking it into being. But it's all commands. Speaking commands. Over in Luke, Chapter 17, these guys were realizing, hey, this guy's doing everything through his faith. We've got to get our faith increased here. Luke 17, verse 5. The apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Well, he told them what they had to do. The Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted to see it, it should obey you. We see that he's saying, apply your faith. Put it in operation. That's one thing that will make it grow. But there's another thing that's important that's also implied in here. Because when he says, be thou plucked up here, this statement he makes is a command. Otherwise, if your faith is going to increase, you've got to function in commands. Because that's the way God does things. And be thou planted in the sea. You command this thing to be planted in the sea, as it says, imperative mood. And remember, this is God doing this, passive voice. And it, what you speak, obey you, will obey you. Not should obey you. Actually, it's not because this is a factual statement. Because this is the indicative mood. If it was a, it should obey you, or might obey you, or would ob maybe, maybe obey you, that'd be subjunctive, wouldn't it? This is an indicative mood. A indicative mood is a statement of fact and reality. Essentially, the way you would say, you should say it is, you command this root to pl be plucked up by the root, be the plant of the sea, and it obeys you. That's really what it should say. Not, it should obey you, like, oh, maybe it won't, maybe it will. If it didn't, it should have, you know. It obeys you. That's really what it says literally. Because that's an indicative mood, a statement of fact. If you are believing. Otherwise, so what's he saying? Apply your faith, work your faith, and make commands. And it obeys you. Because you are speaking as a king. Your faith is to be put in operation. Look over here in Luke 17, come down to verse 19. Here's the ones that had the 10, ten le uh, lepers. Nine of them got cleansed. And then when he says, we're not 10 cleansed in Luke 17, 17, where's the nine? One well, only turned back. There's not found the return to give glory to God, save this stranger. We've got to give glory to him. So he said to him, arise, because he turned back to give glory to God. Arise. Well, that means having risen. This is the command. The command is here. Go thy way. 
That's the commanding statement. Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Because he gave glory unto him. He saw this command issued and it brought forth his victory. Over in Luke chapter 18, he spoke a parable to them to this end that men must, it's necessary, always pray and not to faint. The word necessary. Must always pray and not to faint. That's, we just have to do it. That's the way it is. And there was a city in the city a judge which feared not God. Now remember, this is, this is a parable showing something forth. There was a city in the city a judge that feared not God, neither regarded man. But there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. Was she asking him to do this? No. She was commanding him to avenge me of my adversary. I command you to avenge me of my adversary, essentially. <laughs> Telling this judge what to do. <laughs> That's the way you actually report, you're supposed to do things in, in law. You don't request. I remember when I was a claims adjuster, they said, you write, I demand. You're demanding things according to law. That's the way things work. Avenge me of my adversary. So, of course, he would not for a while, but after a while he said it within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, this widow troubles me. I'll avenge her lest by her continual coming she wearies me. The Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? And why did she get it done? Because she commanded this to be done. Why are you going to get it done? Because you command it to be done. And then he says in verse 8, I tell you that will he, he'll avenge them speedily. This means with quickness and speed. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Well, where is he going to see faith? In the one who's commanding. Avenge me. If you're not commanding, where's your faith? Essentially, that's what he's saying. The reason why she got it done was because she was commanding, avenge me of my adversary. God wants us to start speaking commands into being. Luke 18, 42. Here's the guy, another one getting healed, uh, who was blind. Verse 42, Jesus said, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. When he says here about receiving thy sight, he commanded him to receive his sight. Essentially, it's all one word. It means recover your sight. I speak to your sight. See, essentially. See again. You could even turn out, this could even could be, uh, blepo means see, and anna can mean be like again. See again. He just commanded it into being. And says, your faith has saved you. And immediately he received his sight and followed him. He commanded things into being. That's what God wants. Look down at Luke 22. Verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired. The word desired is a form of the word iteo, demanded. He's demanded to have you. It's really what this really means, demanded. Satan is demanded to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, destroy you, overthrow your faith, essentially. He says, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. You're going to speak commands and you're going to stop all the things whatever the devil wants to bring against you. doesn't matter what he's demanding. You're going to command and demand and stop his works. And he said, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. Otherwise, when you've learned to do this, you get converted and you're doing this, you strengthen these guys. Imperative mood. Command. Tell them what to do. Get them this to strengthen means to get them stable, get them firmly set fast and fixed, get them firm on all this. So they are using their faith to command things into being. These guys learn how to put things in operation. So you've got to understand, faith is a law. 
and you put laws in operation by speaking commands and demands. Romans 3.27, where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Faith is a law. Faith is not just something you have. You have a spirit of faith, but you function according to the law of faith. It is a spiritual law that you put in operation as you speak commands. So you take hold of promises with your faith. You, you speak commands. and you don't, You're not passively waiting for it. You're speaking it into being. That's why you continually speak it into being. Knowing that it's happening every time you speak. 1 Corinthians 2. What's your faith in? Verse 5. Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of God, but in the power of God. Excuse me, not the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith is not in the wisdom of men. It's in the power of God that's released when you speak it forth. And it brings things into being. That's what God wants. And he's given, you every, he's given you the means through the weapons that he's given you to conquer every enemy. Look what it says in Ephesians 6.16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You use your faith, you can stop them all. Every fiery dart, none are going to get through. As you start commanding and speaking against them, you resist the devil, he will flee from you. That's a commanding statement. We're going to speak against these ones. When you get into the fight, these are commanding statements. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Fight. This is a command. You are going to fight the good fight of faith. You're going to win because it's a good fight. You're going to lay hold on eternal life. A command. You're going to take hold of everything that God has for you and speak it into being. You take hold of it with your faith. I believe that I take hold of it. You make that as you made a demand of what's due you. You're going to speak all these things to be into being. And over in First uh, Peter chapter five, where verse eight says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the level devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast." You are to resist. And this is a command. Resist him steadfast in the faith. You're going to conquer this guy. He's going to flee from you. You're going to knock him out of the way. We have total dominion. James account, chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. When he tells us about submitting ourselves, this is a command. God wants you to submit yourself to God so you're in a good you're in a position now you can release your authority. I mean if you remember the guy who had the great faith, he was under authority to the Roman government and he understood how authority worked. If you're not under authority to the Lord, you aren't going to operate in anything. That's why you got to deal with sin. You got sin in the camp, your your faith's going nowhere. Your authority's not going to do anything. Resist the devil and he will flee. You set yourself, you stand, stand against this. These are commanding statements. And he will flee from you. You have authority. You have dominion. You can speak all these things into being. To bring the things of God forth, you pray commands or demands, or do you? You speak commands to bring things forth with your faith. You speak them into being. Faith makes demands of what's due you according to spiritual law concerning the promise of the inheritance that's yours. All things are yours. You take hold of it and speak it into being to bring it into manifestation. That's why Abraham, he learned how to do this. He called those things that weren't happening as happening, speaking them into being to bring them into being. You command, you demand, you speak commanding words, you speak things into being. That is the way a king operates. You and I are going to function as a king. We are going to use our authority. We're going to bring forth. God wants every promise coming to pass. And our faith is what brings it to pass because we speak these things into being. He's given you a spirit of faith to speak these things into being. What have you been speaking into being? 
What are you commanding to come into being? What are you making a demand of what's due you as you have the scripture promise and then you take hold of it with thanksgiving because it's already been given to you and you speak it into being? That's what God wants. Remember, all things are yours. Every promise is yours. And you and I can bring these things into manifestation. Remember what Jesus was doing. He was bringing forth or upholding or bringing forth all things by the spoken word of his power. He spoke everything into being. That's the same way that you and I are going to do. God wants you to develop your faith by applying it and start using it and speaking things into being and commanding and making demands and doing it continuously until you see the results. You keep your faith applied and every time you speak, it's happening. And do not doubt, do not get in unbelief or that'll shut down your faith. Make sure you're submitted to God or that'll shut down your faith. Sin in the camp, your faith's going nowhere. You get over in the flesh, you're not going anywhere. You get double-minded, you can't take hold of anything of the Lord. Got to be staying in faith and stay in the Spirit. As you operate this way, you're going to develop and you're going to see God's authority and power operate through you like you've never seen it before when you operate as a king making commands. That's what God wants. Look, that's what they did. Jesus did it and they did it in the New Testament. That's how you operate and see, act as a king and see God bring all these things into operation in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you. I am a king. I am in the position of a king. I have authority. I am to rule. I am to fight. I am to make decrees to bring things into being. I thank you. You've given me faith. And I'm going to put my faith in operation as I believe and I speak things into being. I will make commands. I will demand what's due me. I will make decrees and speak things into being. And when I speak them into being, they are happening. I thank you, Lord. I will operate as a royal priest. I'm going to start speaking. Everything that you say to speak to, I'll speak to every mountain. I'll cast out every devil. I'll resist every enemy. I'll speak every promise into being. I'll call those things not being as being to bring them into being. I will declare and speak the word of God with commanding statements to bring the things of God into manifestation. And I believe that what I say is happening as I'm speaking in line with the word. In Jesus' name, amen. You are a king. This is a powerful message. This is a strong message. This is what they did when they pray. You know, what do people do with the, what's called the Lord's Prayer? They sing it, they recite it, they do everything, but do what it says. <laughs> Kingdom, come. Will of God, be done. Daily bread, come. Give. Deliver, deliver me. I take hold of your deliverance. I speak my deliverance into being. Deliver me in Jesus' name. You speak those things into being. You're not being disrespectful to God. Remember, you can do nothing. All you're doing is releasing Him because that's the way He does it. If He speaks things for it, be opened, be made whole. That's what you're supposed to speak because you release Him to do it through you. Praise God. We are going to operate as a king. Father, we thank you and praise you that we are a royal priest, a kingly one, and we are going to operate as kings, and we are going to make commands and demands and decrees and speak things into being, and we thank you. As we act upon your word, we believe your word, we do your word, you will bring these things to pass. I thank you that every one of us will work our faith and develop it and we will operate as royal priests. Thank you for much fruit. 
as we hear and do this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. On Sunday, we're going to...